Hello everyone, today we are going to be talking about some of the uh, common genetic modification techniques that humans have come up with that we have been using in industry for the past uh, several decades. Uh, some of the more interesting ones that I've, I find interesting, there are lots and lots of different techniques that we've done um, and I'd like to talk about them all. So, but we'll only talk about a couple. So. Typically, when we hybridize, that we something we mentioned last time, one of the problems is that in hybridization, uh, a lot of the times we can't get a fertilized or a uh, fertile or even a seed seed that will grow. So essentially, a zygote that won't form. It's like when we cross when we cross a uh, horse and a donkey to get a mule, the mule is in, is infertile because of a mismatch in chromosome number. So same thing happens in plants. Uh, sometimes we crisscross, you know, we fer we hybridize two different organisms, and those plants they just don't uh, the seeds, the embryo count or the chromosome count don't don't match, and uh, we have trouble getting those uh, those crosses to actually make it to the point where they can be a zygote or a seed, and that will grow. So humans have thought of a lot of different ways of getting around this uh, to trick things into growing. And I, there are a whole list of them. There's some really cool ones. But we'll talk about a couple that are interesting. So here is uh, one example. Now these are things that are not classified as genetic engineering. We definitely are modifying the genome because we're creating a hybrid, just like in, uh, in, plant, in plant crossings where we just are taking pollen and crossing it to a, to a, a different plant. Uh, to see it to fertilize it with uh, with uh, an, a different species, but here or even a different uh, cultivar. But uh, these, so we're going to be doing, we're going to be talking about things that are that are modifying the genome, but they're not classified as genetic engineering, so they don't fall under the label I mentioned in the other video, the GMO label. So when you're buying a, a food that says GMO free, it could still be one of the products of the following techniques. So embryo rescue is an example where the non-viable embryos, so of hybrid plants, uh, so we're talking about crossing two plants that would not be able to perform to form a seed that would grow. Well, we can take the, the initial crossed, uh, crossed cell and they're actually able to extract that cell, the, the single pollen grain that is that has been, uh, or the single uh, cell of that that sort of egg cell, ovum cell from the from the plant that's been fertilized by this other plant breed or plant cultivar, and they can actually take that and just insert it into a vat of tissue that's already uh, that's already living, and by putting it into this living tissue, maybe into uh, some some host tissue from one of the two parents. They can uh, they can kind of put it in this sort of uh, you know we, the equivalent would be stem cells in humans, uh, drop this embryo in there and then it will start to grow. It's kind of tricked into growing by saying by seeing these healthy living cells around it. The embryo cell is more stabilized and able to grow. Uh, it's sort of like it's already been duplicated, and so it doesn't uh, it it starts to to grow. It doesn't go through the natural process of forming a seed or forming a seed in the same way. But it starts to grow, and uh, and they can even plant it eventually, uh, or transport or transport it to a to a more natural uh, growth place. So it's sort of an in in vitro uh, fertilization sort of approach to uh, plant breeding. Uh, so using two different plants uh, and hybridizing them, uh, but then where the cell would normally fail to grow, they drop it into a into a host cell into a group of host cells that will help it to survive. It's, uh, it's an artificial crossbreeding. This is not genetic engineering as the genes are transferred in a through this sort of natural pollination. We're still experiencing some pollination even if it's, uh, it's administered by a lab technician. It is pollination. All of, the, all of the chromosomes and all of the genes from the one plant are being transferred into the other, into the other plant. So uh, we're bringing everything, all the genes, even the good genes and the bad genes. We don't know which genes are coming over. We just know that they're getting over there, and we're getting, we're going to start growing this plant or animal, uh, which we don't really do this for animals yet. Now, uh, or successfully. 
mutation breeding is another example. So in mutation breeding, this is a, a fairly old technique. It's 1920s, you'll see here. Uh, in mutation breeding, essentially, we apply some sort of chemical or radiation to the plant, uh, usually in its early seed stages or in the plant before it produces pollen or before it produces ovum. And uh, those will cause some random changes in genome. And then you just grow a whole bunch of them. You do this to thousands of plants, maybe at least hundreds, and you grow hundreds and hundreds of seeds, and then you look at the hundreds of seeds that you grew, and you pick the ones that are the best. And you start using selective breeding. So you create a whole, uh, a whole group of mutants, and then you start picking out which one's your favorite, or which one's the best. It's, uh, it's sort of like, imagine uh, after the Mutant Ninja Turtles were formed, you pick, uh, you know, you only pick, get to pick one of the mutant tur ninja turtles that you like the bat the most, uh, the most traits for. Did you like Michelangelo for being a cool dude? Did you like uh, Donatello for his smarts? And then you take that one mutant and you discard the other mutant, the mutant ninja turtles, and uh, you uh, you keep that one mutant ninja turtle and become he becomes breeding stock. You, I don't like that. Okay, so. Um, in this case, we're talking about, uh, so this is a case that is done for, for generations now, and the crops were, are essentially unregulated in this case, uh, but, and they are not considered genetically modified organisms. They do host a wide variety of mutations, good and bad mutations, but we don't know what they are because it's not in a controlled way. It is, uh, it is a bulk mutation technique. We are essentially applying a mutagen to the entire genome. We're changing the whole genome, right? So uh, there's a po or potential to change the entire genome. Worldwide, there's more than 2,300 different crops that have been developed using this technique, including wheat and grapefruit varieties that were developed as early as the 1920s. No record of the genomes prior to mutagenesis, so it will be impossible to label all the crops. Now, some of the good mutations are good for farmers, bad for the plant. So, for example, things like larger strawberries and larger fruits and vegetables and things like that will often come, or larger fruits will often come at the expense of resistance, for example. So, if we look at something like the strawberry, strawberries have certainly been selected for, I don't know if there's been mutation breeding on them as well, but they've definitely been selected for for their large fruit size, but this has come at a weaker resistance to funguses and pests. And nowadays, uh, if you have strawberries, those strawberries were at one point coated in a very, uh, in a very strong, uh, a, a very strong antifungal spray, uh, which uh, can lead to the, which uh, protects the strawberries. It's one of the reasons why when you wash strawberries and you put them back in your fridge, they almost, uh, they go bad almost instantly. They even, they'll gain a, you know, a green fungus on the outside right away because you're washing away that protective layer. But if you're going to go eat some strawberries, you probably should wash them. Eat strawberries, blueberries, you know, grapes even. Wash those with a little bit of soap and water, and you'll find that they, uh, they taste a lot better because you're washing away some of these organic chemicals that we use to protect them, uh, these pesticides and fungicides. Okay, so now we're going to talk about genetic engineering. That was just genetic modification. Now we're talking about genetic engineering. So genetic engineering are controlled. Controlled, control, control. Control is key. And when we develop genetic engineering as in uh, biology, we are, we are talking about the development of control over the genome. Not just random mutations, right? This is just a random mutation. You've got essentially a bunch of cells in a, in a Petri dish, and you're going to hit them with something. What is it? Uh, lightning, you know, is it electricity? Is it, uh, is it some sort of you know, uh, some sort of uh, poison, uh, that'll work. Uh, is it, uh, you know, um, radiation? We don't know what it is, and it's going to affect the entire cell, right? The whole thing is affected. Here, we are now moving to genetic engineering, which is a modification technique that looks at single changes or small controlled changes. So we might be looking at controlled deletions or controlled translocations or even insertions of new genetic information. But it's going to be specific small pieces of information which will be going into the main body of information that is not changed. 
So billions and billions of uh, gene pair of uh, A, C, T's, and G's that are all going to stay intact, and we're going to make some small changes to it using a controlled insertion or a controlled deletion. Meanwhile, if we look back at the at this uh, you know mutation breeding, we would be looking at every single chromosome has an equal chance of being affected. But genetic engineering is the one that is being targeted by that mod by that labeling system for the GMO free labeling. This is a food that would be under certain legislations in certain countries will be labeled as a GMO food uh, or a GE food. So they are almost exclusively found in labs. There's actually very few genetically engineered plants and animals that are available on the market. Um, and it does allow for the crossing of traits between non-breeding organisms, so non-species. So it's species that are, are two, two organisms that are not the same species can share a gene this way in a way that would not be possible. It could even be used to simply, simply modify an or, a gene that the organism already has. So one of the techniques is called recombinant DNA technology. This is a type of genetic engineering that isolates the genetic information from the separate species and combines them in new ways, creating new genes. These new, this new DNA is transferred back into the, the living organisms, and then the cells decode the new genes and express its traits, and ex the expression of the trait is displayed. These organisms then become transgenic organisms. They have or they have genes from two different species. So that's where this uh, this terminology, transgenic, an organism that has DNA from different organ from alter other organisms. So how do we get the the DNA into the organism? Well, the most uh, the fanciest way is something like a microbial vector. So this is where you take a bacteria or a virus that has DNA uh, DNA modification abilities. So some bacteria and some viruses can actually um, change the DNA of their host. Um, so especially viruses. Uh, I think we mentioned at a previous time that the human de human genome even carries some viral DNA. So we take one of those of those. Uh, chemical. So here is an agrobacterium, for example, and it has in it a, a plasmid that is able to attack chromosomes and insert genetic information. So this is a bacteria that has a DNA editing ability already. This is the natural ability of that bacteria. We can then change, modify this bacteria with a new piece of DNA that we extracted from some other organism. And uh, this is the gene for something that's favorable. It might be even this type of plant, but a very rare type of it, right? Or, uh, or a type that's not, a, not as, doesn't produce a nice fruit. So maybe, uh, you know, a, a sister cultivar that has stronger roots, but not as sweet a fruit. So you could take that, that, that strong root gene out of that out of that strong root plant and then add it to uh, add it to this uh, this plasmid allow that plasmid to attack some some cells of this plant as they attack the cell of the plant they will insert the DNA that they've been loaded with and then when the plant is grown it will be grown with this new trait so it gets the new trait from the from the translation and transcription of the gene that you inserted into the plant. So the genome has been changed. The chromosomes now contain a new uh, new information that they, ne they didn't have previously. But the important thing to note is that this was a gene that already existed. It's a naturally occurring gene with a naturally occurring protein uh, that component to it, but it was on a, it was in a different organism. And often the case is going to be that it's a related organism. So we're usually not looking to insert proteins that human beings have never seen before, although sometimes that's the case. But we are, we're, the biologists are typically looking at proteins that we already understand, but they're in an organism that we think it would be useful for it to be in, uh, in, or, in this other organism. Now, uh, 
prior to this sort of fancy technique, we had a one to one that I really like to talk about because I just think it's so wild. And this is micro projectile bombardment. This is another way of getting DNA. Um, it's not particularly useful. It's not particularly helpful, but it has a, it has produced a couple of valuable plants. And essentially, what you have is you get a petri dish of of cells, right? So we got a bunch of cells here. I guess I should probably make them plant cells because it's almost definitely a plant. So you've got some plant cells. You know, these are plant cells. They got a little. You know, there's our our nucleuses, and we and what we do is we then uh, set up essentially a device above it, and it is essentially kind of a gun. And inside the gun, you load a little piece of DNA. Lots and lots of copies of this piece of DNA. And then you accelerate these pellets of DNA into the cells. And so what we're doing is we're just going to take this piece of DNA here and we're going to accelerate it into the cell. I'm just going to make more DNA. And you are going to take it and we're going to inject it right into the cell. It's going to be fired into the cell. And most likely it's accelerating fast enough, it might actually destroy the cell. Boom, destroy the cell. Boom, destroy the cell. Boom, destroy the cell. Oh, it gets through. And it actually gets through far enough into the DNA, into the, the nucleus on some small chance. There's a small chance that it actually penetrates into the nucleus. And then now that it's in the nucleus, it can be transcribed, it can be translated, and it can start to produce protein for the cell, whatever the protein that was, uh, that was being described by this DNA. So that's another way to get DNA in. This is an older technique, not as common. And I, we used to do a whole bunch of different ones. I have a whole list. There's, a, there's so many different techniques for getting DNA into a cell. Uh, as we'll talk about later, the, the newest technique is, of course, uh, the Cas9 CRISPR system, but even newer than that is a newer version of Cas9 that's uh, that's already come out in the last year. Now, um, I'm going to end the video there, and in our next video, we will talk about genetically modifying animals and how difficult and challenging that's been, and what success has been there. So, hope you enjoy this video, and we'll talk to you soon.